Well, all is not well with the dragon at home. We are talking about China and its economy. The report card is painted red. The big GDP numbers are out. China grew by just 6.3% in the April to June quarter of 2023. The latest number is below analysts' expectations and may force Chinese policymakers to unveil more measures to support their economy. In more bad news, youth unemployment rate has jumped to 21.3% in June. More than one in five young people are unemployed. That's a new high and shows that the country is unable to boost its industrial capacity. Overall, urban un unemployment remains at 5.2%. These numbers are crucial as China is looking to bounce back from last year's zero COVID policy. Remember that that saw the country's economy plunging to record lows. So why are the numbers so worrying? First, sluggish consumption. For almost three years, strict zero COVID policy meant repeated lockdowns. Once the restrictions were lifted at the end of 2022, millions flocked to restaurants, shopping malls, and even on holidays. However, that optimism has not lasted. The recovery has run out of steam and the labor market is now under pressure. Also dragging on the economy, is the dire finances of some local authorities. They have seen three years of huge spending to combat COVID. China also faces formidable challenges related to climate change. As per Raw DM Group, an independent research provider, China's reliance on heavy carbon-intensive industries makes its green transition burden heavier than most nations. Next, the real estate crises. Bricks and mortar are a pillar of the Chinese economy Property has long been seen as a safe bet for middle-class Chinese seeking to grow their wealth. The demand sent property prices soaring. This happened as developers expanded at breakneck speed, thanks to generous bank loans. But as the real estate company's debts reached unsustainable heights, authorities pushed the brakes into 2020. Since then, developers' access to credit has been considerably reduced. Lastly, Chinese trade is also under threat. The country was long described as the workshop of the world and it remains highly dependent on exports, making it vulnerable to changes in the global economy. The threat of recession in the United States is weakening international demand for Chinese products. In June, exports fell for the second month in a row. The decline in China's economic output is worrying policymakers who are expected to implement a number of measures to turbocharge their economy. There could be more spending on big-ticket infrastructure projects, more support for consumers and private firms, and some easing in the property policy. But analysts say a quick turnaround is very unlikely. And for more on this, we are now being joined by Klisman Murati, who is the founder of Pareto Economics, a global world affairs research consultancy from London. Klisman Welcome to the program. Thank you, Eric. Now, market analysts say that the faltering economy appears to have helped prompt a shift in the willingness of senior Chinese officials to engage in diplomatic talks with geopolitical rivals abroad, including the United States, and to show more openness on economic policy at home. Fixing fraught relations with the West, can that really save China? Well, we have to understand the history of China to answer that question. And we need to realize also, economically speaking, Eric, China is a very young country, 22 years old. And I use that metric by seeing when it joined the WTO in 2001. So in that relatively short 22 years, it, it's been developing at rapid paces with expectations that it will grow and continue that growth trend. So when that doesn't happen, and with the, the systemic importance the, 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 the systemic important nature of China, any slowdown in the Chinese economy means a slowdown in the countries which sell to China. And naturally, the biggest trading partners that China has are Western nations. So if relationships are fraught with Western nations, if sanctions and if trade barriers are put up amongst these partners, then business will ultimately suffer and, eco and the, uh, the economic situation will be on a downtrend. So yes, I do believe that any positive moves in developing better trade relations with its Western counterparts can do great things because of how, in, how, how intertangled these economies are with each other. Let's 
talk more about this relationship, the Chinese government has also been on a charm offensive, so to speak, directed at domestic and even international business leaders. Will this eventually work and give some impetus to Beijing in the long run? Well, naturally, it has to work because we have to realize that China has a sort of five-year policy. So the last five-year policy, the 14th five-year policy put in place a few years ago, uh, was focused on dual circulation development systems, which means an interdependence or, 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 or independence of trade and of domestic development, right? Mm -hmm. And we're learning that this was put into place pre-COVID. And when COVID comes along, it really changes your, your economy in a, in, a, in a very drastic way. Every single economy had this. Uh, China was also one of its major, uh, it hit China majorly as well. So when it looks now to develop into the future, it needs to really take into consideration domestic tensions, i.e. the property market, unemployment, which at uh, 5%, as you mentioned before, mm -hmm. for 1.4 billion population, that's 70 million people. So that's almost like the population of the, of the United Kingdom unemployed. Mm -hmm. So all of these different tension points, domestically and internationally, is going to force the policymakers to open up its economy and to forge relations with partners where if it was in a better state, it wouldn't be so open to forging links to. This is what happens when economies falter. By force, you're meant to change domestic policies and also international policies. Let's talk about those policies then. Do you think China's stringent policies have a role to play in denting the economy? And what button does President Xi Jinping need to press to, you know, change that for the better? Well, if it was as simple as that, Eric, I think we wouldn't be having this conversation because he would have done it already, you know. But we have to realize that China is a major player unto itself, okay, and it's sort of, it has its own sphere and its own sphere of influence and its own orbit almost with the international organizations that it has set up and that it leads in. BRICS, for example, the Shanghai Corporation Organization and its investment bank, the AII, the AIIB, right, which is sort of a competitor to the World Bank. Mm -hmm. So it has its own sort of system of influence across the world. But when it comes time to, for example, the supply chain of semiconductors, it has put restrictions now through its policies to Western companies for this. Now, naturally, this is doing it to secure its own place in the world and its own technological leadership. But policies like this do not help, for example, um, sort of create better relations with its partners. If we look at also China in relation to India, although it's cooperating on things like BRICS, they have very fundamental differences for you know, geographic policy and also military policy, which there have been frictions of in the past. So it has many, many things to do because it's so systemically important to the global economy that there's a lot of emphasis and focus on China for its policies and what it introduces because it has such a big impact in the world. All right, I've been talking to the founder of Pareto Economics, a global wild affairs research consultancy, Kizman Murati. Thank you for talking to We On Wild Is One today. Thank you, thank you. We On is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news on the move.